Ready to roll? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I'm joined this morning by former NFL football players Herschel Walker and Jack Brewer. I also have a statement from Nancy Lopez, who is a, a professional golf um, Hall of Famer. Uh, she had scheduling conflicts, so she's not able to be here, but she did send a statement and support as well. We also will have comments shared by collegiate athletes, high school athletes who will be collegiate athletes, and then high school participants as well, and those involved in the sports area and arena. Listen, we're here today to talk about fairness in women's sports. It's an issue that I've been heavily involved in for years. If you remember, uh, back when the USDA tried to force boys and girls into the same events at 4-H Rodeo, I fought with the 4-H Rodeo team here in South Dakota to make sure that they remained separated. Uh, I led the fight to protect fairness for girls in the rodeo arena, and when we won in 2018, it was because we approached it in a smart way. I've been very consistent in telling people that I believe the girls should play girls sports. It's clear that each and every one of us as men and women have exceptional gifts and differences. They should be celebrated. But those differences are very real and the physical differences are very real. Men tend to be stronger. They tend to be faster. Men have different bones, tendons, and ligaments. They also have larger hearts and lung volume and on and on. And these biological differences lead to very different athletic capabilities. So put simply, it is fundamentally unfair for men to compete in women's sports. And it's a violation of Title IX. Now Title IX was created to level the playing field between men and women. It was intended to give opportunities to women, to let them to compete and to be successful in college athletics. And it's for this equal opportunity to be fair that girls should play girls sports. Girls sports give girls the oppor opportunity to demonstrate their skill, their strength, and their athletic abilities. It also gives girls the opportunity to obtain recognition, to be successful, learn valuable life lessons, and also gain college scholarships or even an athletic career beyond high school and college. So this issue matters to me on a very personal level. I have two daughters that played college sports. Uh, they had an opportunity to compete at that level and uh, enjoyed and learned many life lessons from that experience. I played school or sports in high school, not in college, but I did in high school. Now, if my girls had been playing against men at the college level, their ability to compete would have been dramatically different. In fact, I'm not even sure if they would have been allowed to compete at that level or even qualified to compete if they had even had the opportunity to participate at all. Participating in college sports uh, teaches teamwork, it teaches leadership, work ethic, and grit. And it also develops your talents and your skills. I would not have wanted my daughters to miss the opportunity to learn these life lessons. Now my daughter Cassidy is pregnant with a baby girl right now. Uh, she's going to have a little girl that will be my granddaughter and I want my granddaughter to have the opportunity that my daughters had. Now last year at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, my health secretary said to me, Governor, do you want to make decisions that make people feel good or do you want to do good? And I told her that I wanted to do good. I wanted to make decisions that actually created opportunities for people, kept them healthy, but also gave them the chance to be successful. It's not enough just to say that only girls should play girls sports. We need to take action that actually does good. And we need to defend Title IX, the legal framework that gives women the opportunity to succeed and to thrive in sports. For months, really since November, my team and I have been talking to well-respected legal scholars at the national level. We've been trying to figure out how to defend women's sports effectively. We didn't want to just take action that would make us all feel good. We want to take action that would actually do good. And we have to do that in a way that we can actually win. We can win the argument, we can win it in court, we can win it nationwide for all of our girls. That legal victory has to be based on Title IX. And our participation trophy just isn't going to cut it. Let's take action that really gives us the result of protecting women's sports. Now I want to be very palms up with each and every one of you here today. These legal scholars think that South Dakota's chances of winning a lawsuit against the NCAA are very low. The NCAA is a private association. That means they can do what they want to do. And even though it fundamentally, I fundamentally disagree with them, 
when it comes to this issue, if South Dakota passes a law that's against their policy, they will likely take punitive action against us. That means they could pull their tournaments from the state of South Dakota, they could pull their home games, they could even prevent our athletes from playing in their league. That's their prerogative. So a fight that doesn't truly protect women's sports and doesn't allow women to compete ultimately is going to hurt South Dakota families. And if the NCAA did take action against the state of South Dakota, we could sue them. I know we could do that. But these respected legal scholars inform me that, that we would likely lose at that level facing the court circumstances that we have in front of us. So we could pass a law, then we could get punished, then we could face expensive litigation at taxpayer expense, and then we could lose. We'd have nothing but a participation trophy to, be, to show for it. Or we could take a different path entirely. So today we're announcing that we're forming a coalition called DefendTitle9Now.com. The coalition will uh, consist of athletes, leaders, and everybody who cares about protecting women's sports. Once we have enough states on board, a coalition brought big enough where the NCAA cannot possibly punish us all, then we can guarantee fairness at the collegiate level. Here's the pledge that I'm asking all the partners in this coalition to sign. The undersigned agree that Title IX needs to be protected and that we commit to working together to keep fairness in women's sports. We believe that only girls should play girls' sports. Title IX was passed to protect fairness for women. The federal government should enforce Title IX in a way that protects fairness for women's sports rather than misusing it in a way that undermines fairness. The NCAA and other athletic sanctioning bodies should not take any adverse actions against any state or school that acts to protect fairness for women. That is the pledge that we are asking people as a part of this coalition to sign on to, and we've had many people do so already. We're going to hear from a few of them this morning, and I want to welcome and open it up for Herschel Walker, former NFL football player, to speak with you and share his thoughts today. Hello, I, I, I am uh, Herschel Walker here in Washington, D.C., but I want to uh, thank Governor Nome, who's a great leader, and I want to say that I'm very, very proud to stand with Governor Nome and so many others to protect Title IX and the fairness of women's sports. I made a statement many times ago that uh, women have fought so hard to come so far by not protecting Title IX, uh, we've set women by uh, years. So I'm very proud of Governor Nome and so many others to stand and defend Title IX. So I want to thank everyone for uh, giving the recognition of uh, protecting Title IX. Thank you, Governor Nome, for at least asking me to come along with you, who have shown that you're a great leader. And thank you, and to all the women out there, we got our continue to fight for you for the fairness of women champions on the sport. So uh, you have Herschel Walker to sign on with all of you. That's great. Thank you, Herschel. I appreciate that more than you know. Uh, let's go to Jack Brewer, who is also a former NFL football player that will share his thoughts on defending Title IX as well. We'll see if we can get Jack up. While we're waiting for Jack to get online, I will read to you uh, Nancy Lopez, the four-time LPGA Player of the Year and a member of both the LPGA Hall of Fame and the World Golf Hall of Fame, her statement that she sent to be read here today. I support Governor Nome and her efforts, efforts to defend Title IX. We must protect fairness and for women in sports. When competing in sports, girls should compete against girls and boys should compete against boys. Ever since I was a young girl, I have fought for myself, my three daughters, and all women to have equal opportunity in sports and life. Anything that diminishes Title IX undermines the rights and opportunities of young girls and women all over this country. I want to thank Nancy for sending that, and we'll hear more from her later as well as she intends to be actively involved in this coalition. Now, let's see, do we have Jack up? Not yet? Okay, so we're going to move to our next speaker, and we'll keep Jack for the end. 
The next speaker that we're going to have up, come up and share will be McKenna Prouty, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hello, my name is McKenna Prouty. I would like to thank Governor Nome for giving us the chance to be heard at this press conference. First, I would like to say that I am proud to have the individual and unique gifts that I have as a female. And second, that what I have to say is in no way meant to disrespect the transgender community. As a female, I do ask for the same respect in return. Growing up, I had two dreams, to become a medical doctor and to participate in collegiate sports. I have been accepted in the fall to begin my quest for both of these dreams. As a female, I can compete with any male scholastically or when it comes to becoming a medical doctor. But if we are to be truthful, it is a biological fact I cannot compete fairly with males at my level. For instance, my family consists of two girls and two boys. I am the oldest. Early on, my brothers rarely beat me in any competition. But as we became teenagers, I watched them become bigger, faster, and stronger. It is a simple fact. Dreams like these take hard work, dedication, and perseverance. Nobody wants to go into a competition knowing that they will only have the chance for second place. With that being said, we are asking for a fair playing field where we all have the chance to become a champion. I'm asking those of you who have the ability to make these decisions to consider truth, fact, and science, and the dreams of your children and your grandchildren. I respectfully thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Diana. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to introduce Victoria Blatchford, who's going to come up and share some of her thoughts and feelings on Title IX. Thank you, Governor Noam. I'm happy to be here to not only represent women in sports, particularly the sport of rodeo, but also as a working professional woman who is a mother to two kids, a boy and a girl that both rodeo, and we just finished rodeoing out in Rapid City for Little Britches Rodeo. Our 4-H rodeo is a big part of our life. I grew up 4-H rodeoing, and my daughter did, and my son did. And it's important that with five years difference between the two, they had that opportunity to be able to develop and grow in their own each, each individual way. Carolyn, she went on to be the state 4-H rodeo ambassador and did girls breakaway. JJ, John, he did the flag race and <clears throat> uh, the goat tying. Now goat tying is one event that you could have both boys and girls do it, but they have to, they do it differently because their abilities are different. And Governor Nome, if you had not gone to the national level and said and spoke up for what's right for our children, for our boys and our girls, particularly making sure that Title IX girls have the opportunity to compete and excel in, in the efforts that they have. I just think that it was phenomenal and we wouldn't have been able to do that without you. So thank you again. You made a difference. And it's continuing to make a difference by making this initiative happen. Now, I also come to you as a national board member of the National Little Bridges Rodeo Association. So with Little Britches, we have what we call Little Wranglers. Little Wranglers are ages five through eight. They compete boys and girls. And in order for them to be able to compete at that level, they're e very much equal. But as we grow into ages eight, they start to develop. And, it, and if you've been involved with rodeo as long as I have, you've seen that development from the Little Wranglers all the way up to the seniors and now into the college level and professional level. But at age eight, we separate them out to ages eight and above for boys and girls events. And it works really, really well because you can see the distinct difference between their competitiveness as, and their abilities, that women and, and men have separate abilities, as you've already spoken to. But I just want to reiterate that we thank you, Governor Nome, and the coalition to be able to move forward with this and make a difference for us. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. We are going to go next to Don Riker. Don, would you like to come up and share? Thank you, Governor Nome. As a past uh, alumni of South Dakota State University, I rodeoed in high school in the late 50s and early 60s, and SDSU in the mid-60s. I think that what we're talking about here, the differences, as uh, Victoria has mentioned, in young children are not there. But as you get into high school, uh, the big differences really show up in the abilities that men and women have to compete in, in uh, rodeo events and so on. I go back to uh, about the, the late 
uh, 80s, mid to late 80s, and Title IX was important to our family. Our daughter uh, competed in gymnastics, and, and we had some things that happened that uh, we're, we were able to utilize t Title IX and straighten some things out. So I thank Governor Nome for her support on, on uh, uh, ladies competing in sports and not having men to compete against them where their abilities are a lot different and they can compete and beat them and end up with our young ladies being in second place rather than first place when they compete with uh, other people. So thank you, Governor Nome, for having us here and supporting this. Thank you, Don. Appreciate that. Next, we will have Madison Bolwick, who will come up and share. Thank you, Governor Nome. Um, I would just like to say I appreciate and applaud Governor Nome's efforts in ensuring a level playing field for women in sports. I come from a high school um, sport background with four different, playing different, four different sports. And um, I would just like to say thank you very much for your efforts in um, ensuring a level playing field. Thank you, Madison. And next, Madison Sheehan will come up. Hello, I'm Madison Sheehan. I recently moved to the state of South Dakota to come here and work for Governor Nome, and I asked her if I could share my personal thoughts on this issue. I was a graduate of The Ohio State University where I had the opportunity to row there and be a part of two Big Ten championship teams. Most people don't know, but rowing is the Title IX equivalent to football. 25 years ago, Ohio State had the opportunity to add another program. They chose to row, have a rowing program at The Ohio State University. If it wasn't for that decision 25 years ago, I might not have the opportunities to do what I did in college. I want every woman and every girl in the United States and in the great state of South Dakota to have the opportunity to play just like I did. It's helped me in my career, allowed me to learn qualities like hard work, dedication, being a part of a team, and if I didn't have those opportunities to play from a very young age and moving on to be able to be a part of a team in college, I might not be here today being able to work for the governor. So I fully support this, and I hope that we're able to do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. That's great. And last, we're going to go to Jack Brewer, a uh, former NFL football player. Hello, I'm Jack Brewer, former University of Minnesota team captain and three-time NFL team captain. I am so proud to stand with Governor Christy Nolan as she defends Title IX and defends girls' sports as we know it. Women fought so hard for Title IX, and I know that thousands of athletes around the country agree with me. Governor Nome, we have your back. Thank you for standing for us. Thank you for being a voice, and hopefully people around this nation rally around this cause. This coalition will do so much for so many young girls growing up who are pursuing their dreams in sports. We all know this is the right thing to do. And Governor Nome, thank you again for your amazing leadership. So again, I think there's been a lot of conversation around this issue, different bills that are moving through legislatures across the country, and for years I've worked to defend Title IX and equal opportunities for women. Um, I think that we need to continue to do that, but do it in a smart, strategic way that ensures that we don't cut off opportunities for women, that we actually keep them open and help them be more successful in all the policies that the NCAA, the NAIA, and all other leagues and associations have and embrace far into the future. So with that, I will open it up to any questions that you may have. Yes. Governor, this has been so far a non-existent problem in South Dakota. Why is this a priority for you? Well, it is a, a very existent pro, uh, issue in South Dakota because a lot of people are talking about it and concerned about it. And they see the trends that are happening across the country and that we could, in the near future, have a situation where we are dealing with it on a daily basis in South Dakota. So. Uh, what I've proposed to the legislature, hopefully they will consider uh, that they will protect um, women's sports in the K-12 system and that we'll continue to build this coalition so we can protect them at the collegiate level as well. Yes? Jacob Chris Osmo is voting news now. So between the tweets of you saying you want to sign this bill mm -hmm. and you will sign this bill to you eventually not signing the bill, is that simply because what you're seeing today is the NCAA and the fear that they will take the summer league and others out of South Dakota? Well, I'm still excited to sign the bill. Nothing's changed. Uh, but, but looking at the bill, 
uh, after it came to my desk with my general counsel and other legal scholars and looking at it, which we do with every piece of legislation that reaches my desk, we saw some of the things that needed to be corrected with it and can do that through a style and form revision. Um, some of those uh, portions of the bill that we need to fix are those that create a trial lawyer's dream. Uh, there are incredible opportunities for lawsuits and litigation in this bill that don't need to be there. Uh, there's reporting requirements for families that tens of thousands of families would have to comply with each and every year that would be an administrative burden on those families and on the schools. So those revisions would be incredibly helpful to make sure that we have integrity in the program and that we're able to protect women's sports here in South Dakota. Governor, no, the verbiage didn't stop at birth certificate. You added affidavit, which means a young woman, transgender, could go and sue before the court to have the birth certificate change the gender. Why was that added? What I'm proposing is that they be able to use the birth certificate at the time of birth and a legal document that would state what the birth certificate says at the time of birth. What the current bill says um, that was put on my desk is that every year that parent and family would have to prove that that boy was a boy and that that girl was a girl. They also would have to state that they are free from any kind of performance enhancing drugs, yet there's no definition for performance enhancing drugs in this legislation, which leaves it open to all different kinds of interpretation. It could be hormones, it could be steroids, it could be your multivitamin. It's not defined, therefore the litigation aspects of this bill are far reaching and could be, bring big consequences onto families and our school districts. Governor? Yes. Um, some lawmakers have charged that you have filed a reform bill in this way and it does not conform to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to that? Is this overstepping the role of your office? The Constitution says specifically that a style and form revision is whatever the legislature says it is. So if they choose to accept the style and form revision, it is appropriate and it is the right thing to do. It's up to their definition of what they choose to accept. Uh, you've done Title IX now. Is this the state of South Dakota standing this up? And do you have support from other governors in other states yet? Who's signed this? So it's, a, it's a coalition of people that will be athletes, professional athletes like the ones you've heard from today, but more beyond that, collegiate and high school. I'd invite everybody to go to the website, sign up to be a part of this coalition, share it uh, with all your social media platforms because we want more people to be involved. There are also other leaders. I'll be asking other governors to stand up and to support me in, in this coalition and building uh, this agreement on defending Title IX and also attorney generals. I think it's incredibly important we get attorney generals involved as well. So I've spoken with many governors already. We've got a couple of them that have said that they're supportive and will be a part of the coalition, and I'm glad for that. Um, so you mentioned striking the, uh, the collegiate ban uh, from the bill based on litigation. Mm -hmm. um, so as recently as last year, uh, in the Bosbach decision, uh, it was ruled that uh, based on Title VII, that uh, discrimination against transgender people is uh, still based on, on sex. What do you make you think that the, the uh, bill or the, the law that you proposed would not be struck down by the court? What makes me think that it would not be struck yeah, down by the court? That, that because I'm making decisions on the K-12 system that I have full authority over here in the state of South Dakota and acting within uh, you know, our state boundaries to enact policies going forward. So that's why if the statute was signed into law, um, that would be appropriate. If we're going beyond that to the collegiate level, we could do that. Just know that we could face retaliation, it's more than likely. And then at that point in time, we would have to sue which would be a cost to the taxpayers, which based on advice from legal scholars across the country and constitutional uh, and conservative scholars, uh, they believe that our chances of winning that type of litigation would be small. Can you share with us the respective legal scholars who are advising? We will be announcing them soon, but there have been many. Yes. Would you consider taking the money that you're using I'm not spending any money to fight marijuana. In fact, this year the you're sending back your dollars to the court to defend it, and it was the vast majority of South Dakotans that voted it in. So would you That was based on constitutional reasons though. Correct. If you remember, it is when I get sworn in as governor, 
I take an oath to uphold the Constitution. Would you consider taking the money from that argument that you're having right now and instead spend it on a losing battle against the NCAA? So when, when I get sworn in as governor, I take an oath to the state constitution and the U.S. Constitution to uphold those constitutions. Um, and that is what and why we are challenging the marijuana ballot measure as it was proposed because it was unconstitutional so and how it was drafted and interacted. Uh, so that we will continue doing that. Um, but based on that, we also this year, the taxpayers are spending money to put forward programs to regulate medical marijuana as well. So I guess that's a, theme, a theme throughout your administration. What's the theme? Going against the will of the voters. Oh, you think so? Did the voters against. vote on Title IX? No, no. That's to not tear it down? Actually, what I'm doing right now, lose. what I'm doing right now is not using any taxpayer money. This is a coalition of people. There is no state funds going to this. There is no uh, resources that we're using uh, beyond uh, that this will be a coalition of people working together to defend Title IX. Um, and I, that is a federal law that has created opportunities for women uh, that I think a lot of people would like to have a discussion on upholding. Next question, please. Joe? Is there ever a time when it would be appropriate for a trans girl to play uh, the sport without the program? You know, there's uh, biologically, is that what you're asking, Joe? I believe there, girls should play girls' situations? sports based on their birth certificates. Well, is there a, With all my opening statement, I talked about the differences. Sure. Um, uh, are there, if there's no competitive advantage for a trans girl? How do you, who determines that, though? Who determines? I'm, I'm yeah, I, I, I don't see one where there wouldn't be a competitive advantage, but who would determine that, how we would come to that, what boxes do you have to check? You could see the convoluted processes you would get into. If, if Poll 17 does go into law, are you worried at all about the economic impact that could have on South Dakota? I mean, no. Experts say it could be millions of dollars if it's done illegal, and NSIT and Division II wrestling get out of here. The way that I've issued the style and form revisions, no, I'm not concerned about the impact on South Dakota. Have you had any conversations with people that are involved in those tournaments going here through this whole process? Yes. Okay. Can you say who? Uh, no, I didn't ask them if I could share their names today. But yes, we've had multiple conversations uh, with them and with others uh, discussing what the legal ramifications, challenges are. And of course, a lot of it's been public too. There was some public comments that were made after Idaho passed its law. Um, there's been some discussions that have been made since Mississippi as well uh, passed their law. Um, you know, we, it's not a secret as to how the NCAA feels about these types of state laws. You just mentioned other states. Uh -huh. Are any of those governors signing on? Idaho is in uh, a legal challenge right now. And yes, Tate Reeves from Mississippi has signed on to the coalition. Governor Stitt from Oklahoma has indicated his support as well. There's several other governors that um, are having uh, the coalition go through their legal general counsel recommendations, but they're generally supportive of the idea. Governor, um, you were criticized by Alliance Defending Freedom mm -hmm. when you came out for your mm -hmm. uh, challenge vote. You know. uh, now with this uh, coalition, it's mm -hmm. uh, kind of positioning you at the forefront of this issue. Um, I wonder, when you came up with this coalition, did you uh, think about the, the impact on transgender people in the state? Um, and did you consider that you know using this issue that would affect their lives um, is would be done for political uh, expediency or, or gain? Oh, it's not for political expediency or gain. And absolutely, I do think about them. That's why this coalition is specifically formed around girls playing girls sports. It's on the differences between men and women, and the competitiveness of of how they physically are built. It's not a transgender bill. And if you were to put it in that context, that would be completely inaccurate. It is specifically about protecting Title IX and about women playing women's sports. It is not about transgender. And that is, there's nothing in this coalition or in this discussion today that has to do with that issue. But the only proposal is that it would affect yes. transgender people. You bet. Go ahead, Herschel.
Peter in women's sports. And it's sort of like I made a statement about a week ago that if they start doing something like this, uh, you can take myself as an example. At my age today, uh, now I can classify myself as a woman and go and compete in the Olympics. And, uh, and I probably could win a gold medal in certain events in the Olympics today uh, saying I'm a woman. So what, who would you consider a transgender to be able to compete uh, at, in Title IX? So that's why we have to protect the fairness of women and, uh, with Title IX. Thank you, Herschel. We appreciate that. Governor, just going back to my question, um, if, if it doesn't affect uh, transgender people, who does it affect? It affects women. For years, for decades, women have fought for an equal playing field, for equal opportunities, for scholarship money, for programs they can participate in, and to be treated the same as men. That's what Title IX is all about. And it's being threatened by some of the conversations that are happening at the national level, different policies that are happening part of the decision-making process that happens within the NCAA on where tournaments go, how it's determined, their inclusivity po policies, how vague they are and how they've been used in the past. That's why it's important to have an honest conversation about Title IX and make sure we're having a discussion to defend it and keep that right for women out there. Wouldn't this bill affect transgender girls who want to play in girls' sports leagues? Transgender girls who want to play in girls' sports leagues? It will affect girls being able to continue to play girls' sports. And that's how we believe that girls' sports should be defined. All right, guys, thank you.